Hello, my name is Tamar Friedman, Director of Peer Programs at Jewish Funders Network. And on behalf of JFN, I'm happy to welcome you to today's program, Teen Engagement in the Jewish Community via Virtual Platforms. The COVID pandemic presents significant challenges to teen engagement. Organi organizations that work with teens have risen to the occasion, coming up with innovative solutions in response to these challenges. And now we see it is clear that connecting, engaging, and experiencing Jewish life online will continue to be a pivotal, pivotal part of teen engagement moving forward. Mm -hmm. Today, we are fortunate to hear from funders and professionals in this space who will share their expertise and learnings on online teen engagement. They will also share their perspective on how technology and virtual spaces will continue to shape the landscape in the post-COVID world. Our speakers today are Sarah Allen, Executive Director, Jewish Teen Education and Engagement Funder Collaborative, Wayne K. Green, Executive De Director of Honeycomb, formerly known as Jewish Teen Funders Network, Seth Marin, Managing Manager, a um, Managing Member of Marin Invest investors and board member of Lost Tribe Esports, and Jeffrey M. Solomon, Chair and Chief Executive Officer of Cohen and Chair of the Board of Lost Tribe Esports. And I'm happy to pass it over now to Jeffrey Solomon, who will introduce, who will introduce the topic today and frame it a bit more and get us started. So thank you so much, Jeff. Uh, thanks, Samar, and thanks everybody for, for dialing in. And uh, we're, we're excited to talk to you today uh, about what we see is sort of uh, the future of what I would call uh, venture philanthropy. Uh, maybe in a few years, this will be less venture and more mainstream. But I think, you know, part of the reason why we're all here today is because we've been involved in things that are new and different. Uh, and we're trying to look uh, ahead of the curve or over the horizon uh, at some of the new trends we're seeing uh, and how we can utilize technology and the new virtual world in which we operate to essentially extend our reach uh, as funders for, for Jewish philanthropy. Um, you know, I guess to frame this before I turn it over to some of the other uh, folks here uh, to talk about it, I, I, would, I, would, I would suggest that you take a moment to think about how you invest. I think everybody on this call probably has gone through some degree of education around changes we're seeing in the financial markets and how you've adjusted to those, right? You've sat down with your financial planners, or maybe in some cases you are a uh, a, a, you know, you're running a family office or you're actually, uh, maybe your, your, um, your business is, is, uh, financial investing, um, uh, to some degree. And what I say is, you know, what we are trying to figure out always, uh, what's going to be the disruptors. What, what are the things when we look at investing and particularly at a place like Cowan, we're always focusing on, uh, disruption and innovation as a way to think forward. Um, what are the things that are, are changing? And so uh, same things are happening in philanthropy that are happening in the markets, right? We're on this Zoom call, right? A year ago, or maybe a year and two months ago, we wouldn't be on a Zoom call because nobody used Zoom or that number of people that use Zoom would be relatively shockingly small. Uh, and now everybody in the world uses Zoom. And so what's happened over the course of the past year is many of those trends that we see uh, that, that, that uh, we knew were moving online and virtual over at a relative snail space have accelerated tremendously. And in the last year, uh, we're all much more facile uh, at being able to, to utilize these technologies. Um, I would just say for the younger generation, uh, the ones that are up and coming, the people who will be in uh, positions of authority and, and ultimately leadership positions in the next 10 years or 15 years, they are 100% digitally native, which means they've grown up using these kind of technologies as part of their everyday life. And it's happening really quickly. I have two children, uh, I have three children, but the, the, the difference between my oldest who's 26 and my youngest who's 17 and the way they use the technology is radically different. Uh, I will tell you, uh, even though my oldest works in, a te in financial technology, my daughter, who's my youngest, is the one who actually understands more inherently um, how to live in a virtual world. Uh, because her connections and her network is virtual. And so all I would say is, as we think about the conversations we're having here and why each of us are involved with the philanthropies that we're involved with, uh, it's because we recognize at the end of the day that where the, we, we've got, we're going to where the kids are. That's really what it is. We're, we're, we're literally uh, taking what we know uh, from our, our own upbringings and our own connect, connections as Jews, the things that have powered our Jewish connectivity 
uh, over the past three or four decades. Um, the things that we when, when we, when it was foundational for us to become ingrained in, uh, in Jewish social engagement, and we're applying those same skill sets to the virtual world um, because that's where the kids are. And so as you listen to the stories and you listen to us talk a little bit about what we've been able to do in that environment, I just, I want, don't get all hung up in the technology, right? This is not like your bubby saying like, hey, can you connect me to the Facebook? That's not what this is, right? This is literally like, what are the kids doing? They're already doing it. And how do we wrap Jewish into that engagement so that they can have a much more fulsome, um, um, socially connected, Jewishly connected world, just the same way we did. Uh, when we were younger. So I'll stop there and I'm going to turn it over to Wayne, uh, who I think can talk a little bit more about what, what he's doing. Jeffrey, thank you so much. I'm just, um, as technology always works, I'm just trying to sort out the, uh, the this, okay, I think I'm good to go. Um, thank you so much. It's interesting just to hear your reflection and an opening introduction into this in that, you know, technology is a disruptor. And I think part of our discussion today is about the fact that COVID uh, pandemic has really thrown our programming into this level of disruption and how have we really thought about it and what does technology offer us in this space. Uh, just to say, um, I am Wayne Green. I'm the executive director of Honeycomb uh, and we are um, based uh, here in New York, but um, our programs are offered um, throughout um, the United States and internationally. Um, so as I said, Honeycomb is the leading resource for educational content, resources and experiences to really allow educators, professionals, parents and organizations to really think strategically about grant making and philanthropy for Jewish teens. Uh, and our vision is really to create generations of engaged, empowered and experienced change makers and givers. I really wanted to share with you just a couple of key pieces around some of the research around teens today to help frame our understanding about why we really think about the importance of um, engaging teens and using technology. So when we think about the work that we do in uh, Jewish youth philanthropy, really it is about um, how are teens thinking about the world today? In a, the Gen Z study that came out in 2019, of which the Jewish Teen Funders Network, then uh, now called Honeycomb, uh, was part of, Jewish teens are really inspired and empowered to make a positive difference in their communities and the world in which they live. Really important. Another key piece is about Jewish teens engaging in learning that enables them to be more active participants in their various communities. And I think what we're going to talk about today is really about how is technology offering that opportunity to them. When we look a little bit more specifically about some of the research that has been done by Honeycomb uh, and our recent um, study uh, of alumni through our Give and Grow, which uh, was released last year, we really talked about this idea of Jewish teen philanthropy strengthening Jewish identity and a teen sense of connection to the Jewish community. And when we talk about that, the key piece that we think about there is uh, teens feeling connected to Jewish people around the world and being involved in the Jewish community is important to them. And the, really the rationale to thinking about how COVID pandemic has provided an opportunity here is that in this space, teens are no longer defined by geography. They can now connect with other teens, other Jewish teens more broadly in their community and internationally, and they're no longer defined by having to actually just see people um, in their local communities. The next piece really is around Jewish teens um, Philanthropy engages teens in a, new, in a unique way that inspires and challenges them. This is really important because I think one of the key pieces here is about how do we engage teens to think about Judaism in a way that feels relevant to their lives and the dreams for the future? You know, how are we empowering teens to make decisions that are consequential for communities and issues that they care about? When we think about what's happened during the pandemic, uh, you know, we think about the ways that teens engage in the world through technology. And it is our responsibility as educators really to meet them where they are and how they interact in the world. We didn't need to think about platforms and technologies so that they're clicking like and they're clicking shares, that they're doing that in the stronger sense of what it means to be Jewish and how they're engaging in these practices um, through those different platforms. Um, when we think about uh, some of the impacts of COVID-19, specifically to youth philanthropy programs, we found that a lot of philanthropy programs were actually able to transition to be completely online during the pandemic. 
uh, we found that a number of the programs continued uh, because philanthropy can be done in, uh, in technology and used in a way to fundraise and engage people through different mediums. And I'll share one or two of those platforms shortly. Uh, and the other piece too, is that teens were exposed to continual updates around the pandemic through social media um, and other social issues that occurred over the summer here in the United States with Black Lives Matter um, and, and other social issues that occurred. Uh, when we talk about um, some of the technologies that we've actually used um, in philanthropy, uh, one of the ones is we looked at developing what's called our giving hive and how are we connecting Jewish teens throughout the country and internationally to really see what other Jewish teens are doing and to be able to do it in a space that they actually navigate and, and connect more with their Jewish communities um, and their peers. We also developed an online portal around how do we have one central space that teens can actually navigate into and find different ways to connect with uh, their programming. Uh, there's another program that's been developed called Changemakers 90. Um, and another platform which we also used is Gather and how are we offering a platform that allows people to feel like they're actually in person but providing their virtual spaces. Um, I will uh, show you those examples in just a minute but just to give some takeaways around how we're thinking about um, the value add that we can offer to teens today. You know, how are we thinking about programs that are providing innovation in online spaces? How are we exposing teens to connect with teens that are both within their communities and beyond? How, you know, we think about teens connecting with Israel. We can now provide that opportunity by connecting via Zoom, certainly not taking away uh, from the opportunities that teens have to actually visit Israel and be part of that. But there is a way that we can still navigate and connect to our communities outside of what is defined by local geographic locations. Um, it's really important that when we think about technology, you know, how are we capturing their interest? How are we looking at that through socially and emotionally connecting to what they care about and what they're interested in? If it's whether they're playing with games or whether they want to make a difference and being uh, connected to marches and giving philanthropically to change different social justice issues that they care about. Uh, and the other key piece too is, you know, how are we offering experiences that allow an expression of oneself? You know, how are they thinking about their gender, their identity, their commitment to different social justice issues, and how are we offering technologies that they care about in these spaces? So I just wanted to um, share one more piece before handing it over to uh, my colleague, Sarah. Um, I mentioned before about our Giving Hive. Uh, this is a new platform that has been developed um, from Honeycomb where we really think about how we offering teens throughout the country and internationally to go through one space to think about fundraising, to think about connecting to others. So one of our programs, uh, which is in our foundation board incubator uh, here in Boston um, is the Jewish Teen Foundation of Greater Boston. On this platform, the teens can actually connect with one another, they set up profiles, uh, they fundraise together, uh, and they really, sorry, this is clearly technology, it's, it's not opening, but it shows you a number of the different teens connecting to one another. And the other key piece about this is when they doing tech fundraising and they're doing philanthropy, how are they offering the ways to connect to one another? You can see the comments, where to go Ella, um, likes, they can do shares. Uh, and this is really important for us to connect to them, uh, to think about how they do philanthropy that is uniquely Jewish. You know, what are the words that they're showing? Thanks for tikkun olam. How are we saying mazel tov? What are the key pieces that we're uh, implementing in online technologies that enable them to connect to their other Jewish peers and connect to their Jewish um, stories and experiences. Uh, I will uh, finish that there because we will have plenty of time to have more questions and these platforms and the, the PowerPoints will be shared with you after the, this webinar, but I really want to hand it over to my colleague to talk a little bit more and to share with you about the Funded Collaborative and a different program and how they're thinking about technology before we come back to Seth uh, and to talk more broadly about the importance of what technology is offering to Jewish teens today to connect to their Jewish communities uh, and to their identities. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you, Wayne. Um, and we'll be talking on so many similar themes because I think what we're finding across the board is how powerful this really can be. So I am Sarah Allen. I'm the director of the Jewish Teen Education and Engagement Funder Collaborative, and we are a network of 10 communities 
across the country and uh, all co-invested with Jim Joseph Foundation, really trying to experiment with new ways to connect teens to Jewish life. And I will also share my screen and just give you a little a bit of a sense of how we are thinking about this. So hopefully this is working. So I will take you back to the early days of the pandemic. Um, it feels like we're in the sequel now um, as it stretches on. And really very early on, the idea was um, in the mad scramble to shift our thinking, the best we could do was just recreate what was going to happen in the real world and see how we could quickly put it online. Um, and did not really have a chance to step back and take a breather and think about what we know about teens and how this might be able to merge in a more powerful way with what we know about technology. So once we really um, focused on um, really the re developing the relationships with the teens and really understanding who they are and what they needed, we were able to take a little bit of a breather and do a little bit more strategic thinking around how we might be able to best leverage uh, the best of technology. So that started with really thinking about teens first. This is really the zeitgeist of the Funder Collaborative and really thinking about understanding the demographic in a deep and personal way before we really start thinking about solutions. And as we understand them, what we know more than anything is the expectation that teens have to be co-creators in so many experiences. And this is really reflected in how they use technology, which as Jeffrey mentioned early on, is not how we or maybe many others in the older generation use technology technology. It is not a passive experience for teens. Um, part of uh, why it is not, just to go back uh, to a little bit more about the demographic, um, really as we think about teens and as their uh, brains and relationships are developing, these are the experiences that they are going through during this very tumultuous time. Um, this is common throughout the world. There's enormous amounts of physical changes. There's enormous amounts of transition, there's decreases in intrinsic motivation, and there's near constant connectivity. And here's what's interesting about that. We might remember um, back in the day talking about things like screen time. People don't even really talk about screen time anymore because it is so fluid and seamless throughout teens' lives. It's just a piece of who they are because they're getting online with their own personal device at 10 years old. And there are a lot actually of positive benefits that I'll get into um, a little bit later in the presentation about why that actually can be supportive. And one of the things is how they're using these devices and all of the technology platforms. They're extremely proactive. These are culture creators. These teens are just incredibly creative in how they think about um, both representing and expressing themselves and how they can manipulate the world around them and engage others in the spaces that they think about and care about. Um, and if we can harness that for the Jewish world, it becomes even more powerful. These teens think about technology as careers. This is just, um, they're positioning themselves as something that they can use as real life skills that can carry them throughout their entire careers um, because they want to share. They want to express themselves in a way that they feel comfortable um, and really being in control is a very, very helpful thing. So some of the most successful programs that we've seen happen across the country virtually were the ones who really gave teens a seat at the table and put them in the driver's seat of creating some of their online programs because they are the experts. So I, really appreciate this quote, although it's from a business consultant, what I think, and they're really talking about marketing, what's really helpful here is the last phrase, right? In previous generations, we sold to people, perhaps our education attempts were about just handing over knowledge. This really is about giving people a stake and how we can open up the world to teens and open up our Jewish community and help them see that they are part of creating the kinds of programs and things that they want to do. This is also, um, it increases their sense of loyalty and attachment to the programs, but it also is what encourages them to bring their friends into some of these programs. And some of the things that we've seen have been remarkable when teens are really co-creating this is how they want to then share it with some of their friends in their more um, extended networks and teens who, who might not be as engaged in Jewish life. 
So as we look across what's happened in the past year, um, we have really fantastic data, which I'm, I'm happy to send some charts if people are interested afterwards, but really wanted to elevate a couple of key themes. Um, there were a few communities that really um, incentivized creating new programs. Um, and really we were able to evaluate and understand what that looked like. Um, San Francisco really led the way in creating an RFP for communities um, and uh, local organizations that were really trying to experiment with new ways to move things online. Um, and this data is also reflected from other uh, communities across our 10 networks. Um, and really it, it very much aligns with what we know about what happens in the real life. Um, so some of the newer participants who might not have ordinarily engaged with this organization were really interested to how they could attain some real life practical skills. And returning participants were really nervous about losing their uh, contact and connectivity with their peers and thinking about the potential after effects um, uh, and really wanted to maintain some of their social networks. And the more successful programs were ones that really put relationships first. Um, there was a phrase that was circulated in the early days about how it was really about contact before content. And really what we find is when we invest in relationships, okay. that's really where the power lies. So just to give some high level thinking and some takeaways on what we learned across the 10 communities, um, very much in line with what Wayne was saying, um, how teens wanna be connected across boundaries and across geographies. It's very attractive to teens that they can reach beyond their sort of immediate geography. What we also found is especially because many of our communities are in places like Atlanta or Los Angeles, where uh, traffic and commutes is a real barrier to programming. The idea that teens can just participate instantly was very, very attractive. Um, I do wanna acknowledge the idea that um, even before the pandemic, teens were really facing some stress and anxiety. And so being online, there was some safety uh, to feeling less social pressure, and that sometimes attracted new teens. Um, it also allowed them to really think about exploring new Jewish rituals um, in the psychological safety of their own home and not in a, a physical space with other folks. Um, so there was a lot of experimentation happening, um, gave them a sense of freedom. And going back to what we know about teens and how they view um, social platforms, um, and especially even gaming, they see it as a flourishing activity. And what's so interesting is that there's a lot of great research out there that agrees. So flourishing, not just because of the social connections that they really are forming real relationships through these activities, but also um, one of the things that leads to a sense of flourishing is really a mastery. And so when they are able to become incredibly skilled at certain platforms, they really, it increases their confidence. And as we think back to what we know about uh, this demographic confidence is really um, one of the things that we're really trying to help encourage because it leads to a greater sense of resiliency. There's also great research by Jean Twenge who wrote uh, the book iGen about some teens did surprisingly well in quarantine. And it wasn't because they were using less social media, they were using it differently and they were using it to check in on their friends. Um, and they were being encouraged to do so by some of the Jewish programs that they um, are connected with. And in fact, LA is uh, piloting an entire uh, text-based program with Jewish Big Brothers, Big Sisters um, to really see how teens can serve as those peer supports. Um, so there's a lot of great research about why this is all very positive. There are some challenges to doing this successfully. One is uh, the Zoom fatigue that we all have experienced ourselves um, and how do you maintain the momentum and excitement online. Uh, the other is we wanna deepen relationships and often we are in people's bedrooms and in their homes. And are we really training youth professionals in a way to acknowledge um, the, the phrase from the San Francisco evaluation was, random intimacy. Um, there is a whole level of training that we need to do for youth professionals 
around those pieces. And at the same time, our teens might be digital natives. Our youth professionals often are not, especially some of our more seasoned professionals. So there's additional work to be done there. Um, and then the last piece is really echoing how we started, um, really thinking about how moving forward can we think about designing with digital first in mind um, so that we're not just translating existing programs into the Zoom world, but really thinking about the whole ecosystem online. And I'll leave you just with one example, um, which is our virtual college road trip. We launched it last year. Uh, it will happen again in the spring, um, reaching thousands of teens whose lives were disrupted. Uh, they would often make the pilgrimage to go visit schools, um, although for many cost um, was a barrier. We were able to blow the world wide open for them by really immersing them in uh, what we called a jump on the bus experience. It was a road trip through 35 colleges. We'll triple that this year. And uh, the entire thing was designed digitally first in mind. It lived on YouTube and Instagram stories. Uh, things were on demand so that people could uh, listen to webinars in their own time. And it was a very, very successful experience because it really understood how teens want to participate and learn and show up in the world. So with that, I will turn it over to Seth. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Wayne. Thank you, Jeff. Um, that I, I thought everything that you guys said was um, just spot on amazing. Let me let me just um, give you um, a couple of cents from me. Um, and why is this so important to me? Why should we be really concerned, really interested in teens? You know, why? Um, and I'll tell you from my own experience, um, I went to um, Hebrew school for 11 years. Um, and like uh, a lot of people that went through the Hebrew school system, that did not create my sense of Jewish identity. I belong to a, a Jewish youth movement, Young Judea. Um, and through that, um, and through you know, the peer leadership and, and meeting my friends and going to summer camp, all of that created the sense of Jewish identity that I have today. Um, so why teens? Teens is the time that kids start making their own decisions, right? When parents stop telling them everything that they have to do, go get dressed, go get washed up for dinner, you know, they start forming their own opinions. If we can put them in um, situations, and, and we all know this from Jewish demographic studies, um, if we can get them to camp, if we into Israel. It is a transformational experience. And we all know that today there's more competition for teen engagement than perhaps ever before. And specifically because of all this um, online virtual capabilities where they never have to leave their homes. Sometimes it's a really bad thing, but that's where kids are today. Um, so I know Having grown up in Young Judea, when I brought <clears throat> some kids in that perhaps were from mixed um, marriages um, or certainly had no sense of Jewish identity, bringing them in and just having fun with them. And I'm not talking about, you know, this was a um, um, non affiliated movement. Yes, we were Zionists, um, but we weren't any particular, you know, um, type of religious. Um, but we all experience these things together. And as Jews and as having Jewish friends, through osmosis, just by being together, um, that is that was a transformational experience. And, and that, you know, we can we can say the same things about JCCs, you know. Um, JCCs are a wonderful environment. I don't care whether kids go in there to work out or to play basketball, they're playing it and they're working out with other kids. Um, and that's where um, kids are, and, and we have to uh, address that. Um, so, you know, let me just say a few words about um, Lost Tribe Esports. E Why is that interesting to, um, to us, to, to Jeff and myself? Um, and uh, uh, Jeff was the real brains behind this operation, I have to say. Um, but he brought me in because he, um, he bought me lunch and, you know, that was worth a lot. Um, but the, the, the excitement here um, is that um, kids are gaming, period, right? They're gaming. Imagine the opportunity of um, having them game. It's, it's no really, um, you know, con conceptually than playing basketball together. They're gaming together in a Jewish environment. How do we 
um, introduce some Jewish themes into that gaming. So, you know, it's not overwhelming. It's, it's, you know, it's not so overt, but, you know, during Hanukkah to light a couple of candles at gaming together um, is so meaningful. They might not have lit candles before. And of course we asked them um, and many of them said, no, they would not have. So what a wonderful opportunity to en enable them to do that. And for every holiday that we have, but the other really truly exciting thing here is, you know, in, in the best of times, young we might have had 10,000 kids as members of um, the movement. Now, there are larger movements out there, um, and, you know, there are lots of camps and so on. But, um, you know, when, when you start going virtually, if you take a look at, um, you know, the participants, we started two years ago, right? Now we have 20,000 kids who are participating with us on a regular basis. And if you take a look at the uptrend here, you can see clearly that, you know, this trend is um, increasing exponentially. So, you know, we hope by the end of next year, if we were gonna have this conversation again, we'd be at 50,000 or 100,000 kids. It is so difficult to, you know, um, and, and I'm not, I'm not, um, uh, denigrating at all camps. We need camps and we need Jewish youth movements and, and so on. And, and, you know, we'll have a conversation about this later, but, um, you know, we also need this um, because when, when we're talking about, you know, exponential growth, it's very difficult to do that within the confines of a camp or a youth movement. Um, and nowhere else have I ever seen that kind of uh, exponential been a growth in any kind of you know youth activity, teen activity, you know teen activity outside of virtual. And when we're talking about you know um, twenty thousand unique visitors, we're talking about you know if, if if you count the multiple times that they participate and the impressions um, and you know the, the conversations that they're having online, you multiply the engagement. We're not just talking about um, playing games together, which is also fantastic, but you're talking about hundreds of thousands of hours of togetherness and engagement and millions of impressions through this. Um, so that is really truly the opportunity here. Um, and with that, what I'd like to do is I'd like to toss it uh, um, to, to the group um, with, uh, and we just wanna have a conversation here and I'm gonna to toss out the first question. Um, and you know, um, a lot of the uh, concern that I hear about this virtual is, is it either or? Are we worried about doing this at the expense of engaging kids um, in um, the real world, right? And, and you know, face-to-face -face engagement. Is this an either or? Is this an and? And in, yeah, maybe. The, spirit, in the spirit of never letting a good crisis go to waste, and this is a great crisis. Is this an either or, or is this an end? So I'll start and then turn over to everybody. I, I don't think this is an either or. I, I think just like we're seeing multi-channel or omni-channel in, in consumer products where people are both shopping online and then having an, uh, an in-person experience, omni-channel is, is gonna be a part of our lives forever. And this is an omni-channel opportunity, at least at Lost Tribe. We, we fundamentally view Lost Tribe as an onboarding mechanism where we can work in partnership with, uh, with offline traditional players to aggregate uh, Jewish content or aggregate Jewish um, connectivity. So I actually think we've migrated very quickly from, uh, from being an online gaming platform to an online, to, to, to really a lifestyle brand. Because so much of our, uh, so much of our, uh, of our folks are, are, are our participants are on Instagram or they're on TikTok uh, following each other. We, we've started a Jewish influencer network uh, where they're creating their own content. That content is not necessarily about gaming. Uh, when we have, uh, uh, I don't know how much of you, you probably all don't know about gaming, but uh, from, from what little I know, like if you're watching on Twitch, it's like watching, um, uh, it's like watching interactive television. Uh, if we're having a tournament, there's commentary going on around that tournament. Uh, even when we're not doing tournaments and people aren't gaming, they may be in our Discord channel, which is like the chat channel, if you will, in, in, in gaming. It's like a, 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 a you know, Discord is a, a program that's pretty ubiquitous. All the kids have it. Uh, at any given point in time, you would see four or 500 Jewish kids round the clock because we have them from all over the world. 
engaging with one another in Discord all the time. So it's like the youth lounge is open 24 hours a day. And if you want to tap into Jewish, you can get there. And I think to me, uh, for at least for us at, at, um, uh, at Lost Tribe, it's, it's not just the number. So this 18, this 20,000 unique participants, like that means a degree of engagement, right? It's not just you visited once and you left. At, we, we average two to three uh, engagements per unique, identif for unique. Uh, when we pull them in snap polls, because all these kids are so good at snap polls, right? You, you get, my daughter must get like six or seven snap Instagram polls a day that she responds to really quickly. So we do snap polls with our kids. We learn about them. It turns out that uh, 20%, 20 to 25% of the kids um, that are engaged here now on the platform, um, this might be their only form of Jewish engagement. So it turns out we actually might be finding the lost tribe the kids who might not otherwise be engaged. And why are they coming? Because their Jewish friends are coming and, and, and the kids who may be more engaged Jewishly are coming. And now that network effect is taking hold. So we're bringing in people and giving them their initial or their primary Jewish experience. Now we should be looking at ways to partner offline with other organizations so we can hand those lives to, if it's BBYO or USY, or Young Judea, that growth uh, for kids who want to experience more. And there will be an opportunity for those offline uh, traditional uh, charities or, or uh, uh, engagement um, networks to embrace this new group that we're creating, some of which are affiliated, but in many cases, they're not affiliated. And that to me is the power of social network and, and the power of a, of a Jewish social network. So I view it as both online, online and, and, and lifestyle brands that create uh, Jewish just by having kids get together um, and, and then ultimately end up uh, seeing if, if they want to go in, in other directions, um, you know, to have a more fulfilling in-person experience. I, I just would love to underscore that. I think that's exactly right. You know, it, it's, it doesn't uh, benefit anybody to think in terms of either or because teens don't think in terms of either or. We see that they're involved in multiple different kinds of youth groups, right? So it's, it's not a binary world that they live in. Um, and so one of the powerful things about the internet that we found early, early on is um, that sense of discovery. You can go down any kind of rabbit hole. And so what we found in the real world is that what teens are looking for too is the best way to understand the different Jewish opportunities before them. So many of our communities have invested in things like um, really community type of filterable databases and websites so that they could understand that there are so many different kinds of opportunities. And so the more that we can create an ecosystem that partners with each other, that thinks about teens in this expansive way, we can make connections based on their own interests. So I completely agree that this is all additive. The other piece I will also say, uh, and uh, if you recall, one of the headliners in um, Set one of Sarah's slides was uh, I wrote it down teen seek community, uh, and I think the simplicity of those three words uh, frame so much opportunity and complexity that we can offer to this field. The fact is that how we understand community is very different to how teens understand community, and so when they are coming to a philanthropy program or they participating in a esports uh, Fortnite or whatever the game is that they play, I clearly don't. Um, you know, they're coming there because it's a sense of community. They're able to connect with their peers. They're able to to share an experience in a way that is meaningful for them. And so our opportunity here with our programming is like, how are we offering community that is really meeting the teens at their level of engagement and if it is about playing a game or if it is about coming to do philanthropy or it is about um, you know connecting through big brothers big sisters in LA this is the opportunities that we need to explore further and offer to them that kind of meet them at that need so you know Seth to that to your question at the beginning about what do we do is this an end or or and uh, I think that we th need to think about it that this is an and this is not about either or it's about how are we offering this to be complementary to in-person experiences 
and virtual experiences because I think for programs who think that once we're out of this pandemic and what will, that will mean for us to purely go back to in-person events or experiences I think is missing the whole sense of what community has been created by having virtual and online spaces. So I want to I want to go a little bit further um, into what, what you guys um, um, are, are talking about and um, you know that um, in the past, a lot of our experiences, team experiences, um, have been ephemeral, you know, a point in time or siloed, right? You know, maybe I went to summer camp and that was fantastic, but what did I do for the rest of the year, right? And maybe I belong to a youth group um, and, you know, that's, or maybe I belong to ACC or maybe I belong to my synagogue. How can we leverage what we've built here um, to actually make it the engagement more all year round. Um, how can we share um, these experiences among us? I know that um, Jeffrey and, and, and all of us are talking about partnering with different organizations. Historically, you know, I, I think that we, we've, we've um, endeavored to do that um, at, to various levels of success. But what we built and what we have um, um, uh, delivered this year how, what, what does that portend actually being able to deliver engagement, to engage these kids all year round? So I, I would say two things uh, on that. Well, so one, I, I think if you just think about the world of gaming, and again, if you've never been to an online gaming experience, you should know there's actually an in-person element to that, right? If you've ever been to a championship game back, you know, if you, if you, you know, I remember a few years ago, Lenny invited, Lenny Silverman, who is a CEO of Lost Tribe, invited a bunch of us to go to the Barclays Center and watch 18,000 screaming kids watch, honestly, 12 people on a stage I couldn't identify play a game that I couldn't watch. But there they were in person, right? And and, and so, you know, and 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 they, they watch this, you know, by the way, uh, eSports e e is something that everybody can do to a various degrees. So when you think about uh, interscholastic esports, or when you think about, uh, uh, you know, having your, uh, having a, an esports team for your summer camp, right, in a various game, maybe, maybe there's a camp league that gets created. And all of a sudden, you're hanging out with all of your camp friends, and you're competing against other camps throughout the course of the year, you're, you're maintaining that kind of connectivity, you know, readily available, because again, they're already there. It's, you know, they're using these devices. I think that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's certainly a way that you can extend it, but I actually think it extends even, even beyond that. Um, when we look at, at how, um, uh, how it goes in reverse. So the kids that are, are, are involved on our platforms will ultimately become involved in going to camp or ultimately be involved in youth groups, right? Most of the, we know that most of the philanthropic dollars in the world that go after teens go after the same traditional 20% of engaged teens and they fight over like the same the same 20% of engaged teens, uh, but they don't really do much to bring in new people who aren't engaged, right? And so what we're seeing is this online social network, this lifestyle brand that we have, at least at, at Lost Tribe, is actually increasing the audience meaningfully of Jewish kids or of kids who are fringe kids who wouldn't otherwise be engaged. So we don't need to be fighting over the same 20%. The 20%, by the way, are there. So if you're, if you're at all concerned, we have your kids, they're there and we're treating them, you know, really nicely. Uh, it's a safe place to be, right? Uh, so so they're, they're at USY and they're with Lost Tribe. That's absolutely true. Um, but when they bring their other friends in who are not USY kids or not BBYO kids or aren't going to summer camp or don't hang out at the JCC, that's where this gets super powerful because they will then try to figure out ways to uh, bring those folks, those uh, less connected teens into their on offline social networks, right? Join me at this USY dance. Join me at this BBYO gathering. Let's do hell all together when we get to college or university because I know you because, you know, we game together and now we're at the same school and we want to go have a Jewish experience together. So we do Shabbat at Hillel. Like that is absolutely happening. And the third thing I will say is uh, for those of you that are worried that gaming is a giant waste of time, let me, let me, let me disabuse you of that notion, right? My daughter, who is not an active gamer, uh, was involved in the, in the intern program. Uh, she worked on the social media uh, aspect of the in, uh, of, of Lost Tribe Esports, which is to build the social media brand of Lost Tribe Esports uh, in other venues like TikTok and Instagram and so on and so forth, Snap and all that stuff. She parlayed that internship 
into an internship with the Pittsburgh Knights, which is the Pittsburgh version of esports, right? It's the esports team uh, that's located in Pittsburgh. That's backed by the Pirates and the uh, the owners of the Pirates and the Steelers. In sports management, she wants to be the a general manager of a sports team. Like she she has partly that experience being an intern at Lost Tribe Esports into actually having real marketing experience for an online gaming company, a real esports company that's outside of that. And the CEO of that company told me flat out that the experience that she got and that she has has continued to get at Lost Tribe is exactly what they're looking for as they're building their own brand for their own online brand. So this is not just about kids sitting around playing games and not really getting it. There's a real business that's going on here. And if we can provide them with that engagement level, it will have a far reaching effect in their lives as they mature over the next three, five, seven, 10 years. That's such uh, an important really point what, what, is when we talk about, when we think about what teens are actually <clears throat> looking for, it is that applicability and those real world skills. And it's something that I don't know that um, youth programs are always so skilled at talking about and really helping people translate that there are these uh, really unbelievable life skills that teens are learning by participating in some of these programs. So I think if we can give them a language for how they can translate that to CVs, it would be really, really powerful. So I'm going to switch a little bit to the less sexy side about how do we really make this transition? How do you get all of these unengaged teens? And then what does it mean to help connect them to other opportunities? And there really is a call for investment in the kind of infrastructure that makes that happen. So when I look at our 10 communities, we are united by six shared measures of success. Only three are focused on teens themselves. We want to involve more teens, um, teens from more diverse backgrounds, and we want to have a Jewish impact on those teens. We really want to make sure that they're deepening their Jewish engagement. But we also want to create sustainable models. We want to, so that these things don't go away. We want to make sure that teens are on the communal agenda, that people are paying attention and investing and offering resources so that teens are, we're constantly innovating in the teen space. And we need to offer significant professional development for youth professionals who are serving these teens. And I really do think to make that leap from thousands of teens who might be on a different planet that right and maybe we're gaming in this world that we might not understand and how do we you know make year-round opportunities how do we invest in camps so they can offer things outside the summer how do we create a culture amongst youth professionals so that where they're thinking about our teens our community's teens and not my teens my own programs teens all of these infrastructure pieces require investment too they're really a communal based approach to teen life and that's that's where i think that change will come from and it's it's a culture shift that can really be spurred by philanthropy sarah i completely agree with you i think you know and part of being in this call together um for uh jfn is about how are we offering uh different perspectives and opportunities for funders to really think about the infrastructure that's needed for teen engagement yes there's importance of funding a camp set you talked about there earlier uh, about the importance of camp but what is the 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 skill set of the professionals that are delivering those programs how are they understanding technology and what are some of the new technology pieces that are needed by organizations to enable them to have a much stronger engagement uh, you know one of the things that when you talked about camp is that that really had been up until um, this last year a very much in-person experience and what is the space that they can actually connect to some of those kids either before or after camp you know how can they bring them together for a zoom in terms of knowing who the teens are they're going to be in a bunk together is there a way that they can meet each other ahead of time so they're not nervous if there's a single kid going and doesn't have any friends they can meet people on a level playing field because everyone's the same in a cute little box on screen and then how does that then transition to be what it's like when you actually get to camp so i think sarah absolutely it is really critical that organizations and funders are really thinking strategically about what is the infrastructure needs the technology needs for our jewish community as a whole it's not saying one program over another this is about how do we really invest in the use of technology to enable stronger, uh, more engaged Jewish kids to be supportive for a much stronger Jewish community moving forward. 
Um, yeah, I think the point here is that let's get these kids engaged um, any way, any shape that we can, you know, and I know that, you know, just from what we're doing and what everyone's doing here, once we get them engaged, you know, with, with, each, with, with Lost Tribe, you know, we're getting them to, to go to Israel. We're, we're creating these um, uh, programs, you know, between different camps, between different youth groups. Um, and so the first thing is let's, let's get them in, right? And then from there, um, there are so many other things that we can do um, jointly um, and, uh, you know, both together and, and um, as individual organizations. But um, we've never had the opportunity before um, to engage um, so many teens, to get so many unaffiliated kids in through so many different mechanisms, means, and opportunities, and for us to continue um, to engage them in so many different ways. Um, so with that, uh, I think I'd like to toss it back to uh, Tamar. Great, thank you so much. I, I could just listen to this conversation for a lot longer. I love how I all come in with different perspectives, but wanting to, to move things in the right direction to think about teens in our community. And I want to encourage everybody, if we have a few more minutes, if we ha you have questions for anybody here, please put it in the Q&A box in the chat. And I'll start with one that has already come in and, and we can go from there. Whoever wants to start uh, answering it first can go first and we'll move along. So one is, how can technology be used to support individualism with teams, yet bring, um, yet being part of a collective program? Yeah, I mean, yeah. So, so to me, again, we're not, we're not technologists at Lost Tribe. We're using technology that is pretty well known. You know, we're not, we're not also content providers, you know, the games are out there. So we don't, we don't have any expenses that relates to that, but organizing uh, or, 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 you know, organizing the games and doing it in, in, a, in a safe fashion, you know, putting Madrahim in there to monitor discussions, uh, to make sure the language is appropriate, to make sure that we're reinforcing uh, Jewish ideals. Like th that's where we actually get to leverage the existing technologies. It's not like we're creating some brand new technology that didn't exist. We're actually helping in many cases, some of the uh, online hosting capabilities to understand more of what our needs are. Um, which actually uh, happen to be maybe the needs of, of their commercial enterprises. Uh, so, so we're definitely a part of that ecosystem. Um, and then, of course, I think, you know, using that and marrying that up, I can, I can certainly see a future in which we sponsor gaming trips to Israel, which is obviously a tech hub and is deeply involved in gaming and cybersecurity and all these other things that we're using uh, to help uh, make sure that our kids are gaming in a safe environment. Right, Th those are the kinds of things. We we've had our first anti-Semitic challenge, right? And so, you know, that the things that we see uh, in the real world are at play in the online world and, 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 and helping our kids to manage through that is a real life experience. So I think utilizing the technology that already exists in the world, um, we're not reinventing the wheel, we're just using it towards our own purposes for Jewish engagement. Uh, it's not really that hard to figure out once, uh, once you see it in action. Thank the you. other thing, um, Tamar, I would also maybe add there is one of the pieces that, that technology does offer teens is this opportunity to be individual. You know, they can, you know, we can all change our name um, and add our pronouns. There's a way for them to identify who they are. Uh, when they go into platforms that allows them to create emojis, they can select the clothing that they want to put on. They can represent their individualism in that space and still be part of a collective group. Uh, they can think about um, opportunities that uh, allow them to connect to, um, to, to their program. They may have a sweatshirt they may be able to put on virtually. Uh, and I think that's just opportunities that the technology must offer the space that teens can grapple with something that is unique to themselves. You know, how can they like something that is then personal? How can they share something from themselves? And we can see that, we can see what they're interested in. And I think it's really valuable that uh, technology does offer them that space to be individual, but still part of that, that collective nature. And I don't think it detracts from um, a Jewish program by having that individual um, uniqueness um, shown. How about you, Wayne, I'm, you know this bit, but I mean, they share, right? Our kids share crazy amounts of information. On that's how they, platforms. that's how they connect with one another. They share and they, right. and you can, they see what they're interested in. And, and that's the opportunities that we have is that we need to enable programs that allow them to be able to do that. 
Right. So I can see a future where we're, you know, where we're observing like trends in, for Jewish kids and being able to only get to scale, being able to anticipate the things that they're worried about and be able to address some of those things. Like, again, it, it gets into, you know, this is what's happening in Facebook and Instagram anyway, right? The, all, all of these platforms are reading, uh, using machine learning and uh, natural language processing and AI to anticipate stuff. I, I think we need to be careful about things like that on privacy, but why shouldn't we be learning as much as we can about trends in Jewish kids so that we can understand better how to meet their needs and give them a, a help to help them to design their own future. And I think that's really important, right? They all want to be co-creating. They all want to be part of designing their own future. They want to be their authentic selves on platforms. The technology enables that. And we, as the I could say older generation that have the money to make this happen, we need to be figuring out how we're going to take some of this stuff that the corporates are using all the time and apply it to our own needs so that we can be better and, uh, and more tactile at adjusting to the future of Judaism um, because it's right there for the taking. We, we, you know, that, that is the future of Judaism and it's right there uh, for us to learn um, and we probably have a better access to it than we ever did. So I want in our last few moments, if we wanted to just do a quick uh, like go around and everybody, if you have a last comment or thought that you wanted to leave the audience with. Why don't we start with Sarah? Sorry to put you on the spot, but we'll just- No, start. it's wonderful. I, I, I just, you know, it really encouraged all of us to just think expansively, think really broadly about what community means in this age of no boundaries and think expansively the way teens do about the many different kinds of opportunities that, you know, they're not watching TV or on their devices. They're doing both. They can hold all of these things. And I think we need to trust that they can do the same with in-person Jewish programs and get equal amounts out of virtual immersive experiences. Thank you. Wayne? Uh, you know, one of my favorite words uh, that I often like to use is talk about connection. Uh, and I think that we really need to understand what does connection mean in an in-person and a virtual world. Uh, and I think as we move forward around teen engagement and funders start to think creatively about how do we connect with teens, I think this idea of connection um, needs to be reframed with the and in there in terms of in-person and virtual. Thank you. And Jeffrey? Yeah, so I, I guess what I would say is this is our chance to, to change the trend line materially on some of the things we've seen. When you look at assimilation rates, disengagement rates, we've all seen the Pew studies, right? And we all, you know, get all worked up about what are we doing? What are we doing? This is our moment in time. I think Seth said it well, let's not let a good crisis go to waste. They're all online, they're all engaged. We can reach them and learn more about them. We have the chance to design the future of Judaism in a very benevolent way by using these technologies and by, by allowing our kids to flourish. Thank you. And Seth, I'll give you the last word. Um, so I, I agree with everything that everyone has said. Um, and the, the questions that I ask really reflect my um, views on the opportunity here. And I too um, am very, very concerned about where you know, the fact that um, kids are less engaged Israel today, kids are less engaged Jewishly. Um, and, you know, that translates into everything that Jeff was talking about um, in terms of assimilation and, and, and intermarriage and, and the rest. Um, we have an opportunity. We've been given a gift, right? This pandemic, you know, horrible as it was, in some respects has been a gift to us. And, and how we've responded to it um, has been um, really, really energizing. Um, and we cannot let that pass. We cannot let that go. We have to expand on it because of everything that we spoke about um, in, in, this, in this hour. The fact that we can bring in so many um, more unengaged um, Jewish teens at the time that they are starting to make their own decisions, to be able to engage them more consistently um, and to be able to um, hand them off into various different both in-person and other virtual experiences. That is what's so exciting um, for uh, us right now, right here. Thank you. This has been a wonderful hour of just hearing passionate funders and passionate professionals talk about 
how to be open and pivot and move forward and be where the where the constituents are, if that's the right kind of word, and move along with them and bring make the right opportunity. So thank you for thank you to all of you for joining us and sharing your passion and and teaching us and giving us a space to learn together um, in, in this way. And I believe the a lot of these a lot of these um, lessons that you've taught can go in many different places and spaces wherever people are passionate um, to make change. So thank you so much. Jeffrey, Seth, Sarah, and Wayne, and we look forward to partnering again and continuing these conversations. And thank you to everybody that participated today. Um, and reach out to me if you wanted to get in touch with any of the presenters or had any further questions about what you learned today. Be well, everybody, and thank you so much.